Hello and welcome. I'm Sally Levine, Executive Director of the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust. And today we're going to look at a topic, American Witnesses, about American liberators who came upon the camps. They encountered them. They had no idea what they were about to find. In April 1945, young Americans serving in the US military encountered the Nazi concentration camps. Few, even those hardened in battle, expected such a shock. I do not know words that are strong enough or expressive enough to describe the horror I saw in those few days, one US Army Signal Corps photographer wrote to his family. As Allied troops moved across Europe in a series of offensives against Nazi Germany, they began to encounter tens of thousands of concentration camp prisoners suffering from starvation and disease. Only after the liberation of the camps was the scope of Nazi brutality exposed to the world. Soviet forces were the first to approach a major Nazi camp reaching Majdanek near Lublin, Poland in July 1944. Surprised by the rapid Soviet advance, the Germans attempted to hide the evidence of mass murder by demolishing the camp. In the summer of 1944, the Soviets also overran the sites of the Belzhets, Sobibor, and Treblinka killing centers. The Soviets liberated Auschwitz, the largest extermination and concentration camp, in January 1945. Although the retreating Germans had destroyed most of the warehouses in the camp, the Soviets found the victims' personal belongings, including hundreds of thousands of men's suits, more than 800,000 women's outfits, and more than 14,000 pounds of human hair. Allied forces overran hundreds of camps and subcamps across Europe. U.S. forces liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp near Weimar, Germany, on April 11, 1945 a few days after the Nazis began evacuating the camp. American forces liberated more than 20,000 prisoners at Buchenwald. They also liberated the Dora Mittelbau, Flossenburg, Dachau, and Mauthausen camps. British forces liberated concentration camps in northern Germany, including Neuengamme and Bergen-Belsen. They entered the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp near Sella in mid-April 1945, some 60,000 prisoners, most in critical condition because of a typhus epidemic, were found alive. In the Netherlands, Canadian troops liberated the Westerbork transit camp. Liberators confronted unspeakable conditions in the Nazi camps, where piles of corpses lay unburied. The small percentage of inmates who survived resembled skeletons because of the demands of forced labor and severe lack of food, compounded by months and years of maltreatment. Many were so weak they could hardly move. Disease remained an ever-present danger, and some of the camps had to be burned down to prevent the spread of disease. Survivors of the camps faced a long and difficult road to recovery. I, I was 17. I, I was free, but what it meant, I wasn't sure. The special exhibition at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, American Witnesses, highlights the experiences of American men and women who saw firsthand evidence of Nazi atrocities. Using their oral and written testimony, photographs and film, it explores their reactions and efforts to expose and document Nazi crimes and to nurse starving and ill prisoners back to life. During World War II, African-American and white soldiers who were bonded on the battlefield were divided at home. The U.S. 12th Armored Division was one of only 10 U.S. divisions during World War II that had integrated combat companies. Despite the overarching segregation in the military at the time, more than 1 million African-Americans fought for the U.S. Armed Forces on the home front, in Europe, 
and in the Pacific. After battling for freedom and defending democracy worldwide, African-American soldiers returned home after the war only to find themselves faced with the existing prejudice and Jim Crow laws, which impose separate but equal segregation. African-American soldiers process Nazi racism and brutality through their own frames of reference based on their experiences of segregation here in the United States. Many envisioned that their participation in the war effort would finally bring white Americans to the recognition that African Americans could no longer be denied their civil rights and economic opportunity. In this presentation, we're going to look at the experiences of African Americans during the period of the Holocaust, and then at the wartime experiences of two men, experiences that shaped the choices that they made after World War II. So let's look at an event in sports that reflected both the status of African Americans as well as the political tensions that were mounting internationally. In 1930, boxer Max Schmeling became the first German world heavyweight champion. In June 1936, Schmeling finally got a shot at the undefeated African American boxer Joe Lewis, known to boxing fans as the Brown Bomber. A native of Alabama, Lewis was a hero to African Americans and widely respected as an athlete by other fans of the sport as well. Only a few sports were integrated in the United States at the time and boxing was amongst them. This drawing that you see was on the cover of the program for the Lewis Schmeling fight, which took place on June 18, 1936. Lewis was the eight to one favorite and people believed that Schmeling at the time was too old to win. Joe Lewis also believed those predictions and he neglected his training. Schmeling took the upcoming match seriously. He studied Joe Lewis and his fight style and he trained intensely. On the night of the fight, 46,000 people took their seats in Yankee Stadium in New York. They were shocked when Schmeling was able to knock Lewis down to the mat in the fourth round. Even more shocking was when Schmeling knocked Lewis out in the 12th round and thereby won the title and ended the match. The man just whooped me, Lewis later said. Schmeling became a national hero in Germany. A Nazi magazine described Schmeling's victory as a question of prestige, quote, for our race. Joe Lewis's American fans still supported him after his defeat. And a tribute appeared in a leading African-American newspaper with the headline, Joe Lewis, we are with you. Two years later, American and German fans were ready for a rematch. The second Lewis Schmeling heavyweight bout took place on June 22nd, 1938, and it was called the match of the century. Spectators understood that the outcome then was not just about who the greatest fighter was, but also about which race was superior. Schmeling was the symbol of Nazi racial superiority while Lewis represented the African-American community. White Americans also saw Lewis as the symbol of democracy against fascism and Americans against Nazi Germany. American and German Jews hoped that Lewis would hand the Germans a defeat. White Americans, even while some of them were lynching black people in the South, were depending on me to KO a German, to knock out a German, Lewis wrote in his autobiography. I knew I had to get Schmeling good. The whole damn country was depending on me. This time, the crowd at Yankee Stadium was 80,000. Joe Lewis would not go down this time. He beat Schmeling decisively in two minutes and four seconds. When Schmeling returned to Germany, he was no longer a national hero. And Joe Lewis continued to defend his world heavyweight title until 1945. 49, and he remained undefeated. As an interesting postscript, after the war, Schmeling and Lewis actually became friends. And when Joe Lewis passed away, Schmeling was a pallbearer at his funeral. From the end of Reconstruction in, 19, in 1877 to 1950, 
nearly 4,000 African Americans were killed in lynchings. Few perpetrators were ever brought to justice. And from 1933 to 1936, there was an increase in the number of lynchings in the United States. In 1936, Abel Mirapol, a Jewish American public school teacher in Bronx, New York, saw a photograph of the lynching of two African American teenagers. The photograph distressed Mirapol and motivated him to write a poem, Bitter Fruit. It was published in 1937 in a magazine called The New York Teacher, which was the journal of the teachers union. Mirapol, the child of immigrants who had fled pogroms against the Jews in Russia, explained that those ex experiences inspired him to speak out. Mirapol was also an amateur songwriter, and so he set the poem to music. He and his wife, along with African-American singer Laura Duncan, performed it several times at protest rallies, including one at Madison Square Garden. The song didn't become famous, however, until it was sung at New York's Cafe Society and then recorded in 1939 by jazz singer Billie Holiday. Cafe Society was the first integrated cabaret in New York. The founder of the nightclub, Barney Josephson, heard Mirapol perform the song and asked him to play it for Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday was hesitant to sing it. She was worried that her audiences wouldn't like the song and that she might become the target of violence. But she need not have worried. The audience response loved the song and her rendition. Holiday's 1939 recording eventually sold a million copies and became Billie Holiday's best-selling record. And let's listen to just a part of it. As the war in Europe escalated in 1940, the war industry in the United States flourished. African Americans now had some opportunities in businesses and industries which had been closed to them before the war. Many African Americans soon found employment as skilled workers in major cities. In some of the factories and shipyards where they worked, however, they faced discrimination and sometimes violence. African-American labor leader A. Philip Randolph took up their cause. He met with President Roosevelt in 1940. He asked the president to encourage equal opportunity for workers and desegregation of the armed forces. The president was not ready to respond. He was concerned that most Americans did not support either of those changes, and he did not believe he had the support necessary to make these changes through Congress. Randolph decided to plan a march on Washington to protest racial discrimination in the war industries and call for passage of an anti-lynching law and also demand desegregation of the armed forces. His proposed protest had great support among African Americans who began planning and publicizing the march. Shortly before the march, Roosevelt met again with Randolph and asked him to call it off. Randolph said he would do so if the president created an executive order to protect African American workers. On June 25, 1941, Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, 
which is featured here, which outlawed discrimination in the defense industry and created the Fair Employment Practices Committee to monitor and enforce the order's implementation, Randolph soon canceled the march. The order did not address anti-lynching measures or desegregation of the military. Racial discrimination in the armed forces would continue as an official policy through the end of World War II. It was finally abolished by President Harry Truman in 1948. Artist Arthur Schick earned an international reputation for his illustrations of Jewish and American themes during the 1930s and 40s. Schick was a talented caricaturist and illustrator, as well as a human rights activist. When Germany invaded his native Poland in September 1939, Schick began his own personal war on fascism. Schick fled war-torn Poland and came to the United States in 1940 intent on using his art to fight for freedom and democracy. Schick's first published volume of drawings included portraits of African Americans and Native Americans. Schick believed that diversity was the strength and promise of America. By the time the United States entered World War II in 1941, Schick's work was familiar to most Americans. His wartime cartoons appeared regularly on the pages of major American newspapers and magazines. Schick created the drawing feature here during the later years of his life. By then, he was interested in the African-American struggle against Jim Crow and for civil rights. In this illustration, we see the torn and patched uniform belted around an emaciated body, the purple heart pinned to the right breast, and the rope that binds the man's chest and ties his hands behind his back. Behind him stand men in Ku Klux Klan garb, preparing a lynching. The composition represents the experiences of many African-American veterans of World War II who fought to defeat fascism and defend democracy, only to face brutality and discrimination at home. Leon Bass was an African-American soldier in World War II who helped liberate the Buchenwald concentration camp. He later became an educator, civil rights activist, and proponent of Black Jewish unity. In an extensive interview by NPR, Leon Bass provided a vivid oral history of his experiences as a Black man in the South and as an American liberator of European Jews. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Bass graduated from high school in 1943 and volunteered for the army. He went to the induction center with some friends who happened to be white and Leon was stunned when he was immediately separated from them. This was his first taste of segregation in the United States military. He was angry that putting his life on the line to serve his country wasn't enough for him to be considered equal to white soldiers. When he went to the Deep South for training, white locals often treated him with contempt. I wasn't good enough in Macon, Georgia to get a drink of water at a public water fountain. And in Beaumont, Texas, they still said I wasn't good enough to eat a meal in a restaurant. And in Mississippi, I stood up for more than a hundred miles looking at empty seats on a bus that I was not permitted to occupy because they said I wasn't good enough. What a damnable experience to have when you're 18 years of age and you volunteer to serve your country. Leon Bass says that he was an angry young black soldier when he was shipped overseas to Germany. He was setting up camp when the Lieutenant told him and two other soldiers to come with him he said they were going to a concentration camp. I didn't know anything about concentration camps, Bass said. In all the training they had given me, no one ever mentioned concentration camps. But on this day in April 1945, I was going to have the shock of my life because I was going to walk through the gates of a concentration camp called Buchenwald. And you gotta believe me when I tell you I was not ready for that. <laughs> 
I was totally unprepared for that kind of a situation. But you see, I can never, ever forget the day. It was that spring day in April when I walked through those gates and I saw in front of me what I called the walking dead. Leon Bass later recalled the impact of that moment. I realized I was not the same anymore, he said. Something had happened to me. I realize now that human suffering is not just relegated to me. Oh no, the pain and suffering that I saw both in the United States and in Nazi Germany. Oh yeah, that pain and suffering touches all of us, the good and the bad. We all become damaged by the evil of racism and anti-Semitism, bigotry and prejudice. This experience changed Leon Bass forever. He said, for the first time now, I realized that I had something to fight for. I had to be aware how blessed I was to live in a country where the opportunity to change is possible. Testimony three. In April, 1945, Leon Bass entered the Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany as part of an intelligence reconnaissance unit. This is his recollection. We were in the intelligence reconnaissance section of our unit, and we went right to Buchenwald. And that was the day that I was to discover what had really been going on in Europe under the Nazis. Because I walked through the gates, and I saw walking dead people. And just looking at these people who were skin and bone and dressed in those pajama type uniforms, their heads clean shaved, and then filled with sores, filled with malnutrition. I just looked at this in amazement and, and I said to myself, you know, my God, you know, who are these people? What was their crime? You know, it's hard for me to try to understand why anybody could have been treated this way. I don't care what they had done. And I didn't have any way of thinking, uh, of putting a handle on it. No frame of reference. I was only 20. Had I been told, I doubt if I could have had in my mind's eye envisioned anything as horrible as what I saw. William Alexander Scott's life began in Johnson City, Tennessee, where he was born on January 15, 1923. That year, his family moved to Atlanta, where his father, W.A. Scott II, founded the Atlanta Daily World newspaper in 1928. From childhood, W.A. III worked at the Atlanta Daily World in various capacities, from paper boy and cleanup person to sports statistician, movie and play critic, and photographer. W.A. was studying business administration and mathematics at Morehouse College and waiting to marry his childhood sweetheart, Marion Willis, when he was called up for the U.S. Armed Forces during World War II. He served from 1943 to 1946. He and Marion married on August 28, 1944, just before he was shipped overseas. Scott was assigned to the 318th Air Force Base Squadron at Tuskegee for the first six months of his training. They changed the program, he said, and we were sent to organize an engineer combat battalion in Mississippi. And that's really how I ended up, you might say, going into the phase that I did. But when I got into this engineer combat battalion, we had a variety of quiet officers. When one explore, explores the Hall of Memories, some moments cannot be forgotten or dimmed by the passage of time. I remember the day, clear and sunny, riding in a convoy is into Eisenach, Germany, on April 11th, 1945, as World War II was ending. And a third army courier delivering a message to us to continue on to a concentration camp, Buchenwald, 10 or more miles further east near Weimar. I was a reconnaissance sergeant, a photographer, a camoufleur, and part-time historian in intelligence of the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion. We were in the 8th Corps of General George Patton's Third Army. 
and the army issued an immediate order for any man with an access to Buchenwald to go to it before anything was really moved. So it had taken us about an hour to find the place. We thought maybe they were just fooling us again and it would not be worth trying to find. But finally we found it. And as we approached the entrance, we looked at the outside and we said, well, this place isn't what they said it was. And still I said, this place is nothing. It looked almost like the federal penitentiary here in Atlanta from the outside as we approached it. And then as we turned in the gate, we saw a number of the small wooden structures that housed the prisoners. And I later found out that Buchenwald had been a correctional penitentiary, you might say, similar to the federal pen prior to the confinement of prisoners of war, Jews, but mostly there were Jews there. Scott served as a photographer in the 318th Air, Air Base Squadron and the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion. While with the 183rd in Germany, Scott was one of the first Allied soldiers to enter Buchenwald. Testimony 9. In April 1945, William Scott entered the Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany. He was 22. This is his recollection. We drove in, and I said, gosh, it's not as bad as they say. It looks just like a, a regular prison. And uh, we drove around, around it, some buildings, and I saw all these people milling around, and they were in terrible shape and it was all like that that I realized it was as bad and as a matter of fact I ended up saying it was worse and I said there's no way you could dis describe it and I took a few photographs uh, outside uh, and we were told by some of the survivors that uh, over 30,000 had been killed in two week period and that the Germans were trying to kill all of them before we got there After the war, Leon Bass graduated from college in Philadelphia, although he couldn't live in the dorms because he was black. Inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King, Leon began to channel his anger at racial injustice into positive action. He became an educator. Right after Dr. King was murdered, Bass became principal of a high school. He needed to get the angry black students to understand that violence is not the answer. He passed a classroom and heard noise and he went inside to see what was going on and inside he saw a little old lady. She was a Holocaust survivor who was trying to tell her story. She'd lost her entire family, multiple generations, and she was the only survivor. Bass and the survivor talked for an hour that day. And when she heard his story about liberating Buchenwald, she said to him, young man, you have something to say. You should be telling people what you saw at that camp in Nazi Germany. Leon Bass took up the challenge and he began speaking to the students in his school about liberating Buchenwald. His Holocaust education program was so successful in his school that he started speaking at other educational institutions all over the country. He became a noted lecturer on the subject of racism and the Holocaust. Leon Bass's unique perspective as both a victim of oppression and a witness to oppression captivated his audiences. By speaking to thousands of school children of all races about what he had witnessed, Leon Bass educated new generations about the Holocaust. Leon Bass passed away at the age of 90 in 2015. W.A. Scott III, was only two generations removed from slavery. His grandfather was born a slave and fought in the Union Army following the Emancipation Proclamation. His father, William Alexander Scott II, was born in Edwards, Mississippi in 1902. He was educated at Morehouse College in Atlanta during World War I, where he was inspired to establish the Atlanta Daily World newspaper. The paper published news business advertisements, and social stories relevant to African-American citizens of the Southeast and beyond. In 
Scott recalls, my slave ancestors, despite the horrors they were subjected to, had value and were listed amongst the assets of a slaveholder. Had the Nazi position prevailed in the aftermath of the US Civil War, I or others in similar situations would not exist in the world today. My life, as I have contemplated the impact of past events on it, has evolved into a character that exhibits an attitude to fellow humans that they have nothing to fear for me or my family. I am only one, but my wife, our children, a son and daughter, their children, two boys and a girl, and two boys respectively, have the character and function that no one should fear them. They have no design on others or their families. After the war, W.A. Scott returned to Atlanta and completed his education at Morehouse. He began his married life with Marion and in 1948 became circulation manager at the Atlanta Daily World. During the years, Scott covered many events of historical significance occurring in this area, sometimes as the lone African-American walking into a Southern hamlet to investigate a lynching. In 1984, he became publications and advertising manager, a post he held until his death. Scott was also a chess master. In 1953, he went to play in the US Open so he could get a rating and it was being held in Nashville, Tennessee at the Peabody Hotel, which was, of course, segregated. So when he walked in, they said, you can't stay here, you can't do this. So the guy who was the tournament director came to the hotel and said, if he has to leave, then we're all going to leave. So that was like, so they flopped around for a minute and then said, well, okay, but he can't do this, he can't do this, he can't do this. And my dad said, I came to play chess. So that was sort of the way he confronted the system by just acting like he was a human being and doing what human beings do in spite of the resistance to it. During the final 20 years of his life, Scott began to write, speak, and record testimony about his experience as a witness to the Holocaust. His first experience came in 1979 when he met Alex Gross, a survivor of Buchenwald at an Emory University program to bring together Holocaust survivors and witnesses. Gross told Scott that he and his brother were at Buchenwald when Scott's unit arrived and that they called the soldiers, quote, black angels, unquote. In 1981, Scott was awarded a certificate by the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. In 1991, one year before his death, Scott was appointed to that same council by President George H.W. Bush. Both Leon Bass and William Alexander Scott III made an impact on their audiences by talking about the value of human and civil rights. Thank you. This is Patrice Weaver. On behalf of the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust, we thank you for joining us today.